Beneath the burqa, Afghanistan's women are like all of us. They love dressing up, weddings and family get-togethers. In the 70s, the veil was optional. Kabul's middle classes were more famous for their style and their parties. Then came the Taliban's medieval regime. These pictures of the execution of a nameless woman shocked the world. The US-led intervention after 9-11 was to get rid of the Taliban and terrorism, and to end the slavery of Afghan women. Britain helped put President Karzai in power to establish human rights and equality for men and women. They were supposed to cast off their burqas to embrace modern life and democracy. But the truth is that eight years after the end of Taliban rule, the vast majority of women in Afghanistan are still invisible, downtrodden and desperate. Maria, prosecutor of Herat. She's trying to give women protection under the law, but she's on a hit list. I have accepted this danger and sacrifice. I'm as strong as a man. Every morning when Maria says goodbye to her kids, she doesn't know if she'll see them again. Security men guard this top law officer round the clock. Last year, a huge bomb was detonated outside her house, wounding three bodyguards critically. My daughter was terrified, in shock and screaming. It was a very bad moment, and I knew anti-government elements were involved. They did it to threaten me to give up this job. I received a text the next morning saying, worse could happen if I didn't give up. In the Taliban years, Maria, a lawyer, had to stay at home like all women. The extremists haven't changed their attitudes. In the past few years, they've assassinated women in public life a female police chief and four women's campaigners. For a woman in this position in a country like Afghanistan, which has been through 30 years of war and destruction, it's hard enough for a man to implement the law, let alone a woman. At home, Maria's children work on their lessons alone. They never go to school or to play with friends for fear of kidnap. The son of another law officer was beheaded by people who thought he was Maria's child. I don't take bribes. I'm a problem for some inside the system and those outside it too. I have many enemies because I've never acted illegally. Every day, the poor come to Maria to get a fair hearing. This woman wants protection from her husband, a heroin addict who beats her and steals the money she gets from begging. Five years after Karzai's government adopted a constitution based on equality, women still don't get protection from the law. The police are reluctant to investigate crimes against women, and when men are sentenced, male judges often reduce jail terms drastically. Unfortunately, the law hasn't been implemented properly, and there aren't qualified people in the police and judiciary and there's corruption. Women don't have access to all these things, knowing people, bribing people, different ways of abusing the system. We have lunch in Maria's office. It isn't safe for her to go out. Her moral stance against corruption has increased her vulnerability as a woman in a top public position. The only thing that worries me as a mother is my children. They're losing the most precious time of their life and studies because of my position. I'm afraid that one day I might have to give it up for the sake of my children. But there's been little difference in the lives of most Afghan women since our troops went into their country. Saida, married at nine to a 60-year-old man. Eight years on, she's on the run from him. He doesn't care if I'm dead or alive. Saida is just one girl in the most shocking set of statistics in Afghanistan. 
60% of women are still married as children, often at nine or 10. Under Afghan law, girls can't marry under 16, but the law's ignored by families and the government. There was an old man in the village who had already killed two wives and had a very bad reputation. No one would even let him take a dog for a walk. Saida's father died when she was little and her brothers claimed her as their property. They sold her to the old man as his wife. If he saw a shoe or a stick, anything, he would beat me with it. I spent seven years with him, as if I was sitting on a hot stove all the time. I had four miscarriages because of the beating and the stress. Then her husband took Saida on the road, all over Afghanistan, to places where they weren't known, to make money from her. He sold her, forced her into having sex with other men. He would say I was his daughter. He actually sold me to three or four people. You understand what I mean? He took money from these people. I would cry and say, for God's sake, what's happening to me? It was in Mazari Sharif, a government-controlled city, that I found Saida. She'd confided in a woman at a shrine. The police were alerted and Saida was taken to a woman's shelter. Now her stepfather and staff at the shelter are helping her to get a divorce. But Saida's husband won't agree to let her go. He's unlikely to ever be prosecuted for what he did to a child. I am very scared. He is in touch with my stepdad through the phone. When I talk to him, he says he is praying to God for an opportunity to drink my blood. He says he wouldn't even care if he dies after that. Saida's childhood has been destroyed. She's 17 and can't read or write. But she knows that only by educating girls and boys will Afghanistan's women be brought out of the Dark Ages. All the problems we face are to do with a lack of schooling. People who are educated will not make their daughters and sisters suffer.